Okay, so in this portion of the build, we are going to be installing the belt and pinion system on the ox. This is the last part of the mechanical portion of the build. You can see we already have it installed on this side of the rail, and we have it installed here as well. You can kind of get an idea of how it works. The uh, belt, the belt runs, the belt runs in the track under the wheel and over the pulley and it's pretty straightforward how it mounts but we'll go through and we'll do the other side but you can see here it's a, a t-nut upside down so the flange is facing up with a eight, eight millimeter or six millimeter screw in here to hold it in place um, this will give you the belt and pinion system so we'll go ahead like I said I've already installed these because it's pretty self-explanatory we'll go through and we'll install this side um, for the demo and then we'll move on to the electronic portions of the build. As a test for this machine I'm going to be using the GT3 belt. It's got a three millimeter pitch. You can see that this belt is extremely thick in comparison to a GT2 uh, which I have here. Kind of get an idea of the difference in the belt. And this one, the GT3 just seems like a really strong alternative that I just wanted to give it a try. It's more like a rack system, so I really wanted to see how this is going to work out. This is um, a 20 tooth uh, GT3 quarter inch bore pulley, and we'll be using these for the NEMA 23s. And then I have a couple of the 8 millimeter screws here and the, uh, the uh, T nuts. Now, when you mount these in the track, um, you can see here you're actually going to want to make sure that the flange is facing up. You can see here you're going to want to make sure that the flange is facing up and not down into the belt. And this just helps you be able to slide this T-nut back and forth without any issues. Okay on this first step you're going to want to take your stepper motor. I have the flat side of the shaft here facing up just as a, a way to know the position of it when I'm working on it. And then we're going to loosen our set screws. I'm using a two millimeter hex on this one. Let's slide it on here. Okay, once you get it in place, kind of line it up with the wheels a little bit. Doesn't matter if it's not perfect. And then just tighten down the set screw so you can turn this a little bit. Um, and then once you get it to where you can actually tighten it down, just tighten it down. And tighten the other one down a little bit too, just so it doesn't fall out. And like I said, right now it doesn't matter because we can adjust this uh, where we need it as we go. In fact, as the belt rides on this, you're going to want to adjust it left to right so that the belt stays directly in the center of the track. That's important because you don't want the belt to rub against the side rails and fray. Um, this belt here is 6 millimeters width and the track is six millimeter width so regardless it does end up uh, rubbing a little bit the new belt will be five millimeters will give us a little bit on each side to work with and uh, and get our alignment right where it doesn't uh, rub but for now this is what we have so this is what we're going to use okay let's move on to the next step all right so i'm just going to take my belt and slide it through one end here I'm just going to push this back here. Now we're going to take the T nut with the flange side facing up. Slide that in. And I have a little bit of a lip here uh, sticking over. If your T nut is, uh, does not fit in the track there, it should be able to slide in. But if it doesn't, maybe it's misstamped or something like that, you can just try a different one. I ran into an issue where one of them didn't slide in properly. but should be all right and just trying to line it up a little bit with the back edge here somewhere in that area doesn't matter if there's a little bit there hanging over and then we're just gonna put our screw in here now one thing I do want to mention is that if you over tighten this you can actually spin the belt to one side of the rail or the other and that's no good for alignment if you look right here you can actually see the words moving as I as I wiggle this back and forth 
So you want to keep that in the center and one way to do that is to take a little screwdriver or something and hold it against this side as you tighten it down but the best thing that I found is just don't over tighten it. So now I'm just going to take and um, I got the belt out of the track a little bit here and I'm just going to take and push on it see if I can get it to raise up here in the middle just like this. This belt's kind of tough so it might take a little bit. There we go. Just like that. Now right now I have the belt directly in the center of the pulley but what eventually will happen is in order to gauge the proper alignment to keep the belt to one side or the other we can move this pulley back and let the belt you actually just want it close if it sits right on the edge of this it'll actually start to uh, fray from just rubbing on the pulley here so you know you kind of have to gauge that back and forth and do that by looking you know straight down on it this way after you've run it back and forth a couple times um, but that's something that you just tweak by moving that back and forth and you'll see on this side how we've done this and we actually have it riding very close to this front edge. I'm using this front edge of kind of the guide of where I want this to run along the track. That's working pretty good. Okay, so the final move is going to be putting the T-nut into this end here and kind of uh, pulling everything tight. For now, I'm just going to slide the T-nut in here. Try to get it back down here a little ways. There we go. If you notice here the motor actually needs to go up enough to be able to access the bottom two screws. So you're going to want to raise the motor up about um, a little more than halfway in this on these uh, side slots you'll be able to see it where the screws are about halfway. A little bit more than halfway, three quarter I'd say, and then um, go ahead and tighten that down in position. And then we'll be able to tighten our belt uh, down on this end here and come back here and lift this up as needed to if there's any stretching or anything in the belt. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten that in position now. I've already pushed up on the belt. I get this about three quarters and the reason why is you want to have room which you'll see to uh, make sure that you can get this screwdriver in here it has to clear this top track here so I'm not over tightening these okay so that's good now I'm going to go back over here and pull it down you can kind of see it tighten down on here so let me go back over here real quick so I'm going to get this screw started here. Pull this down. And I can use this excess to pull a little bit on here. And I can also slide that T-nut where I want it. Now you don't have to over tighten this. Just trying to get it in position. And then tighten her down a little bit. And that's not going anywhere. Now I'm going to go back and see how that looks. Well, that's working really well. And we'll run this the whole length back and forth and we'll see where this belt lines up. Like I said I have probably a width of a piece of paper on the opposite side. Um, but the whole length of the track you can see down here I'm gonna have to adjust it a little bit because it's getting a little bit off of there. So I could move that in and I haven't really tightened down that pulley either so that's something else we want to go back and do. I'll go ahead and do that now before I forget. This belt is nice and tight so there's no need to lift this motor up anymore like we thought we were going to but there's no need for that. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this motor down all the way. Make sure we have a good connection here. Try to want to balance everything you do on this side with this side over here. If I wanted to really balance that, 
I should actually loosen this up and lift it up a little bit, but I think we'll be all right. We'll give it a test. If we have to do that, we'll go back and, and do that. So that completes the belt portion. The only thing I have left to do is to go back here and cut this off. And, you know, you might, um, especially on this, might want to leave yourself a little bit extra and tuck it into the, into the hole here just so you have something to pull with. In fact, I could tuck this whole extra belt that I have here into that hole in case I want to use it for another project or, or something else. So that's probably what I'll do. So I tuck that in there. This is what it looks like. Just looks fine. It's just out of the way. I got plenty of extra belt in there if I ever need it. And that looks good. So if we need to fine tune it, we will. But for now, we're going to move on to the electronics. Alright, for this section I'm going to go ahead and install the circuit board into a little project box I have here. This actually isn't a project box, but I went through and uh, just found this box. I thought it would be perfect for it. Uh, works out pretty good. I'm going to mount this right on the back of the, of the ox. I'll show you later. But I wanted to show you these uh, two circuit boards that I got. This is the Gerbil and it's sold by uh, Synthios. Let's see if you can see this. Version 4. Um, Synthios.com. And you can get this board. It's a shield. It has pins on the bottom here that plug into an Arduino development uh, platform. Uh, such as this, which is an Arduino clone. It's, a, it's the Seed Duino. You can actually buy these two as a bundle. And the way it works is it plugs in to line the pins up and it expands this Arduino microcontroller which is the red board into a, a driver so now you can drive three stepper motors and it's really nice um, however this is not for uh, high current so this is all experimental subject to change seeing as we are using three of the NEMA 23's on this um, on this build of the ox so we may have to change up the board um, to be able to handle it but I figure I give it a try I have this you know so one of the things I want to mention before we go too far is on this board you'll notice that there are some header pins soldered on right here in front of the y-axis you're gonna to want to put some tape over the over this like I did here because when you install the wires in here, you do not want them to short out on these header pins that are going into the uh, into the Arduino. Um, so these are your three axis screw down terminals, and these are your screw down terminals for your power. Um, the only other cable that you would have going in here would be your USB. So the plan is, I've already gone through, move this out of the way is uh, I've mounted a small fan, box fan here as you can see I'm just gonna have this blowing right onto the chips and I may even add some uh, heat sinks on here see how that goes um, this is going to plug directly in with the power that comes into the into the uh, shield here for now what I what I've done is I've actually drilled a couple holes here on the bottom that will allow for the five millimeter so that I can mount this to the back of the rail so without um, bringing this whole camera assembly back to the back of the machine if this is the back rail here um, you line up these two holes here and you can see how that's going to mount. I actually had three holes but I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to use these two here and what's nice about this is it also gives it kind of a little tray for the wires I have to run back and forth on here uh, that works out really well uh, another thing that we're gonna have to do because we only have three axes to work with but we're controlling four stepper motors on our y-axis we're actually going to combine um, now that's the front to back axis we're actually going to combine the two stepper motors to run all slave off of this one driver may not be ideal but this is what I have to work with right now so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it and what we're gonna do is we're gonna use one of these wire blocks we'll have um, the two 
stepper motor wires going into here and uh, one since one's on one side of the machine and one is on the other side of the machine we'll have to reverse two of the coils on one of them so that it runs in the same direction they run the same direction even though they're facing each other uh, then coming out of here we'll just have the the standard um, four wires which will go right into the into the driver board here so the first thing I did after I drilled these holes was to line up the circuit board um, the main Arduino circuit board so that I could get this hole here and this hole here they don't really have a hole over here so I figure well I'll just use these two they'll give me the the sturdiest mount I'm not even going to mess with this one and you can see I've already uh, did those two holes and, whoops. and that's going to be that's going to put us like right about here and I have some of these M3 screws I think they're 10 millimeters and uh, M3 nuts and I also have some of these little nylon spacers so I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, hook this circuit board up okay so what we're going to do is we're going to put the M3 screw through here going from the top down just make sure it's not touching anything metal there which it shouldn't be and we'll put our spacer down I'm actually going to see if I can line up both of these at the same time got the screws in place let's go ahead and install this board I just have my finger on the back here they don't have to be super tight all right so now we have the board mounted in the box that looks really good it's pretty well centered we'll go through and um, attach our driver board now make sure your pins are aligned and that's it, it simply pushes in the nice thing about being clear is that you can see in here and make sure everything's lined up which it looks good the next thing I'm going to do is install the wire block but actually before I do that I think I'm going to wait when I bring the wires in I could do that um, after the fact uh, because I'm going to have two sets of wires going in one side of this from both of the uh, of the Y steppers so I'm going to need this out so I can work on it and really just kind of get a, a hold of it and then then I can mount it in here I've already made a couple holes here for it and I'm hoping that they don't get in the way of my uh, USB or my uh, power here but that's just where it ended up and if they do I'll just let it float or I'll glue it somewhere else out of the way I have a couple of the M8 screws here and also a couple washers and this is going to be used along with some a couple probably push-in T-nuts and we'll We'll go ahead and be able to mount this case right to the back of the beam of the back of beam on the ox and I don't know if I showed this before but I also cut out some holes here to allow for the wires to come in figure two here one for the power one for the for the USB I probably could have just uh, gotten away with one here and just taped them together um, and then I have one here on the top which will be for the z-axis one thing I wanted to mention is the holes here on the bottom that will line up with the v-slot so that you can mount this box to the back you're going to want to take a look back here because as you notice these stick out so I'm going to go through and I'm going to make these holes a little oblong so I can adjust this where I want to on the track so that this lines up I can already see this is a little bit low so I'll bring these holes down a little bit so that all three of these bottom holes are in a line something you might want to do ahead of time so that that's just a real quick easy way to make a case for your electronics that you can mount right to the V slot alright so let's move on to the next part of the build alright so we're looking at the back of the ox and here we have the X stepper um, our Z stepper and the, one of the Y stepper wires here and 
the other Y stepper wire over here. And the motor leads on these were a little short, so I just uh, soldered a new set on just so I could run on, from this side over. Um, the reason for that on the on the Y here is I went ahead and installed a wire block here, and then ran ran a set of wires off of here that correspond with these wires, so that I could run this. Uh, or slave this off of both sides and the the plan here is to uh, wire this side into here on top like you see here but we'll switch one of the coils so that this motor on this side runs opposite um, so basically they'll both run uh, together and then we'll wire the set of wires here into uh, our, our y-axis all right, so the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and mount our, our project box onto the back beam here, like you see. And I'm hopeful that this stepper motor wire is going to be long enough. It's got to be able to you know, run all the way across here while it's in there and then all the way back across to here. So might be a little bit tight, but we'll see how that works out. One of the things I wanted to mention now, of course, I've got the belt already tied on here, and I can easily move this motor back and forth, no problems. But one easy way to find a coil on a stepper motor, a two phase stepper, is just to take two of the wires and cross them together and see if you can still get a smooth movement, and we can on that one so we'll take the red this time and go with the blue I happen to know that red and blue is a coil so once I put this together it becomes very hard to move it you can feel the resistance so we know that this is one coil and obviously the remaining two wires would be another coil once again without anything touching and then if we touch this coil together okay so that's our that's our second coil now it's also helpful to know which side is the negative and positive of each coil which uh, we'll get into later once we wire up this block so at this point um, let me just move this out of the way and you're going to need either the drop-in T-nuts or you're going to want these push-in. I'm going to try these push-in uh, T-nuts. See how they work. And they just they have a little uh, ball on the back of them. Kind of like a socket. And they're not real tight. They just push in there. you got to kind of align them pretty good. And something like that. And I have a uh, eight millimeter screw and a washer and the only reason I'm using the washer really is because of the hole I had to bore this hole out pretty big so I'm just gonna put that in like this and we'll mount this on okay so we have the project box mounted it's just on here loose I can go back and tighten these up probably have to lift this up a little bit get that level but that looks good and the plan here at this point is we're going to wire up the X, Y, and Z. The difference being that on the Y where we have the slave motor, we're actually going to leave this motor off for now. And we're just going to run this straight through like you see here. I've got the motor leads going into the wire block. And then coming out of the wire block, we'll hook right into the Y axis here. And what this will allow us to do is later... You know, once we get everything working the way it is now with one motor, we shouldn't have any problems, you know, testing the movement back and forth. And, and then once we have that, we can go back in and introduce this one into the wire block here. Now, while we're doing the testing, you're going to want to make sure that this motor, obviously the leads are not touching because if they're touching, it's going to have a hard time. It's not going to be able to move back and forth. So may want to take a little a little bit of tape and, and and just keep these separated so we'll start on the 
x-axis which is our left to right here I'm gonna look and see if I have a black sleeve that I can slide over this just to keep it from rubbing against the uh, the box here okay so I found some of this black PVC tubing and I just slid that over and we're gonna go ahead and hook up our x-axis now remember to keep the coil separated and if it runs in reverse we can swap any of these two coil wires normally uh, on this particular setup it'll be uh, you know from left to right red blue black green or normally red and blue are pretty constant with most stepper motors but sometimes you'll have um, yellow and uh, green instead of black and green so we'll start with red and blue for the first coil and then we'll go with uh, either black and green or green and black either way let's do that now alright so something like this is what you should have and you'll notice if you move the stepper motor you'll get feedback into the system so you don't want to do that too much um, just to get an idea that it's connected and uh, should be good to go there that takes care of our X now I'm gonna mount this I'm probably gonna put uh, some tape right here just so I can slide this in in here and it'll kinda of be like a wire strain It'll allow me to do my full run all the way across here um, you know you can kinda of play with that and get a get a sense of where that should be kinda of take the strain off of this of this wire so but for now for testing purposes I think I'll just wrap some tape on here so it stays and uh, once I close this it should lock it in place so it can't uh, pull out and then the idea is it just runs back and forth back here okay good deal that's our first first stepper hookup it may be a good idea to drill a hole um, through here in the back here um, that way you can run the wire directly through the back here and it would be nice and neat and you wouldn't have it on the top running back and forth that may be the better option I'm not real happy with the plastic of this project box either we need something a little stiffer but for just for demonstration purposes and getting something hooked up um, you know this will work um, eventually I think we're gonna upgrade this driver because it can't really handle these NEMA 23's we'll go with something with a little higher amperage um, but I'll take it slow and we'll just test it and see how it works and and at that point swapping out the driver board will be pretty easy everything will be where it needs to be okay let's move on to the next actually I think we'll move on to the Z so this particular stepper is a NEMA 17 it could be a NEMA 23 if you wanted it to be you could change out the uh, the plate here at the top and on this one we're going to be using um, you'll notice that they don't the wire colors are not the same this one actually has it has the red and blue for one coil but it does not have the black it has a yellow instead so we're gonna hook it up the same way with red blue um, but this time yellow and then green and we'll see how that works if it needs to be reversed we'll just swap the yellow and the green and we'll be able to reverse that some of the software let, allows you to reverse it in the software as well okay so I have the z-axis wire stripped back and I wanted to reiterate on this section up here because the camera wasn't showing it these uh, little horns here I wanted to show that you know you run your you can run your spindle motor wire through here as well as the stepper motor wires and any other wires that you might have acts as sort of a, a strain relief uh, but also allows it to be movable you put an o-ring or rubber band or something around here to hold these in place you also have a, a hole here on this back plate that you could mount a, a strain relief if you want as well to continue to run these down perhaps like that okay so let's go ahead and hook up the z-axis once again following the rules of 
uh, of these two coils, red and blue, as the first two, and over here we have black and green, but we're going to go yellow and green. And if we have to, we can we can swap those out. Let's go ahead and hook that up now. I find if you put a little bit of a hook on it like this, it makes it much easier to fish down in the hole. I also like to go back through and pull on the wire once it's tightened down just to make sure. Make sure you have no wires that are uh, bunched up over the edge here, touching on the other side or anything like that. You can even go through and tint those wires if you want. I'm going to attempt to run this through the same hole as the last one. Let's just see how that works. Not bad. Tighten that down a little bit. Pretty good. That's a that's approximately where we're going to keep that, I think. And then the wire management is just something that you kind of have to mess with. You could put coiled spring here to kind of hold things where you want them to go. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of different ways. Cable tracks. You could even possibly run a cable track back here, but not enough wire on this little machine to do that, I don't think. All right. So for the last axis here, the Y that we've saved for the last. Um, I am going to have a couple holes here to mount this, but it's not actually going to line up like I was hoping. I'm going to probably something like this and then run this around like so to get into this middle spot here. I'm going to go ahead and hook that up now and I'm going to leave this loose so I can, you know, mess with it um, later when it comes to actually installing the, the, the slave motor. Now I'm going back behind this. I just think it'll be a better overall connection. So once again, the same uh, color sequence the red, blue, uh, yellow, green. Let's go ahead and hook this up. Okay, on this one, don't forget to put your tape on these exposed header pins that are underneath here. You're going to want to make sure you have a piece of electrical tape uh, covering those up. You can't have those exposed when you're putting your wires in here uh, because you definitely don't want them touching. So, you know, I forgot to mention that ahead of time, but go ahead and cover up those header pins before you actually install that. And if we have to swap any of these two coils, we can do that. But first we want to make sure that this stepper motor is moving in the right direction. And once we know that, we'll introduce this one and wire it just the opposite. It'll be red-blue and then the opposite of whatever to flop those coils. Okay, that looks good. Let's move on to the next step. So we're going to hook up the power supply now. This is the one I'm using. It's a 12 volt 30 amp power supply. It has a standard uh, connections under here. You got two outputs, positive and negatives. And then you have the line in over here, which is just a standard computer, computer type cord. Um, and this is a standard lamp cord. I think it's 18 too. So right here on the top is where we're going to be plugging this in. This uh, this shield will, can handle 12 to 30 volts, so I would rather use a 24 volt power supply. I just don't have one right now, but I'll probably upgrade to a 24 volt. It'll charge the stepper motor coils a little quicker and just should be a better overall performance. Let's go ahead and hook that up. Make sure you note what you're, where you connected the positive to. On the power supply, I have the positive here and the negative here. And this power supply has a copper color wire here and silver color wire here. So um, I use the copper for the positive lead whenever I'm connecting it. Just keep that in mind when you're connecting it here. And make sure you check which one is which. And on this board, the bottom one here is the ground. For future reference, I'm going to take a Sharpie and mark the top of the screw black. 
You don't want to leave yourself too much of a lead here. Of course you don't want these shortened together. I connect my fan power supply to here as well. And even though I open the door, it's fine because it doesn't, uh, it just doesn't affect it. It won't be in the way. You can go ahead and connect your fan power supply right to, right to this if you want and then have them both go in. Now there may be an output on this board. I haven't checked yet, but, um, so there may be an easier way just to connect the fan right to an output. For this, for this setup, I'm just going to plug in right here. And this fan will blow right over top of these three chips, driver chips, and keep the entire board uh, cool. We may have to put some heat sinks on here, which we could do down the road as well. Let's go ahead, I'm just going to twist these pairs together and then put them in the, and then mount them under the block. Okay, so now I have these twisted here. I'm going to go ahead and I've got the red going to the copper color wire and the black going to the silver. And just make sure you have a good twist on here if that's all you're doing. Um, probably go back and solder these after. I'm just going to take a piece of tape and create a little bit of a strain relief right here because of the fact that the door opens and closes on this wire just to keep it from moving around while we open and close the door so something along those lines there and we'll go ahead and hook in all right at this point we have the power supply hooked up we have the wires going in right here we have our fan hooked in everything looks good we got our steppers hooked up the only thing that we don't have hooked into this block is the the slave stepper which is over here but we'll eventually be hooking that up for right now we're going to go ahead and plug in our USB cable mini con right there and I'm going to route the wire back through here because I'm going to have my computer set up behind here we'll bring the camera back around uh, with the computer on the other side so we're looking at the front of the machine and like I said I have the power supply hooked up uh, I'm not plugging it in right now I'm just going to get the drivers and everything set up for the Arduino board and then uh, we'll go ahead and install the software that we're going to use to send the g-code and to jog the machine around and at that point we can see what direction everything is moving so let's go ahead and close this up and we'll switch around to the front side of the machine to the computer and take it from there okay so on the software side of things we have a couple different choices as far as a controller goes for the machine um, people have written some really cool programs that are Gerbil compatible so let's go ahead and we'll open a few of them and just check out the interface and you can kind of just go back and forth that's what I do and I just experiment with each one and as, as new updates come out I just try different ones it's, it's nice to have the ability to go between them one of them here is called the Gerbil controller the other one is the Gerbil GUI and the other is the universal g-code sender there's another one called TGFX but I think that's for the tiny G controller um, it may work on both I'm not sure I haven't gotten to that one yet and also wanted to mention that the firmware on the that's been uploaded to the Arduino if you buy your card let me see here if you buy the G Shield from Synthios it comes preloaded with Gerbil uh, 0.8a which is pretty recent there's one more I think above that which has um, some more algorithms where you can actually go over here and you can uh, you can get into this a little bit more I'm not going to get into the details of going here to the github and, and getting the latest update but you can figure that part out if you want to up update it but like I said this one already comes with uh, one of the newer stable versions preloaded which works out really good and um, so you don't have to load it in there but if you do have to load the hex file I think it's a I haven't done this yet but I think it's just a matter of using the X loader here um, to actually upload the firmware right the hex file right onto the 
onto the Arduino. So haven't gotten into that part yet, but because it was already preloaded, but I'm sure that uh, we can figure that out. So if we want to upgrade, I think the newer one has better stepper algorithms, supposed to be smoother. Uh, just haven't gotten into that yet. But I do want to show you some of the interfaces. This is the Gerbil controller, and you'll see it's got the standard machine coordinates laid out, the work coordinates, um, access control, there's a tab here, visualizer. Um, if you load a file, let's see, you can choose files. If you load one here, um, you can see it shows up here. It's not like, a, as far as I know, you can't rotate this around or anything, but it does give you an overview of the code, which is nice. And, and the um, commands being sent will show up in this window. Um, you can, I believe you can also go in here and change and set up your, your steps per inch and, and all the information that you need. You have a zero position here and a go home uh, position here, button there, sorry. And then you have uh, this one, which I haven't messed with. I just got this. It's pretty cool looking. It almost looks like it's set up for a tablet or something like that. Because you can move these little windows around. Put them where you want. Um, on this one, uh, like I said, I don't have the port open. But, let's see if it'll load. That's not a good one. There's some examples they have in here. Okay, so here's an example code, which is, I believe it's some kind of a fish um, it cut out of a plaque. And it actually has a preview you can load and see what it will look like carved into wood, for example. So it would be something like that. I'm, I'm not even sure how you rotate this one. Yeah, I haven't really messed with it, but it looks pretty sweet. So I look forward to messing with that. It's got set zero. You can jog. Um, got your uh, X, Y, Z's over here. You can reset the board here. You can go home, enable feed hold. You can make the tool size a little bit smaller if you're using a smaller bit. Get an idea of how that works. It's pretty cool looking. Like I said, this one uh, I'm really uh, curious about it. Just haven't had a chance to mess with it yet. And then you have the universal G code sender, which, if I had it plugged in, the serial ports would show up. And this one, it's kind of like the Gerbil controller, a little bit different in some small ways. And you might like this one better, you might not, but uh, mainly. The one I use is the Gerbil controller up here, but um, you can experiment with those. There may even be more out there. I just did a quick search, found a few of them, and thought I would just give them a try. Um, the main one I use is the Gerbil controller, like I said. And Gerbil controller was written by Zapmaker, and you can go to his site. He built a Shapeoko, and he's a programmer. He went through and just uh, started working on this and, and just wrote this really cool interface so you can control your machines. So it's super cool. He, he has updates on here from time to time. You can check out some of the projects he's working on. Um, so cool stuff there. We'll have links for all this and, and also we'll, we'll have the uh, links for the different controller softwares too if you want to try those out. So let's get started. I'm just going to plug the board in into the USB and it should automatically find it. If it doesn't, then you can get into the uh, you can go to the Arduino site and download the drivers, and uh, it shouldn't be a problem. But this particular laptop, it's just a uh, you know the cheesiest one I can find. It's a little Acer, and it, I just plug it in. Everything works great on it. I didn't even have to install the drivers, so um, this works good. So I'm going to go into the Gerber controller. And um, I have COM3 here, but I just hit open the port, and you can see it says close or reset because that, the port is open now, and I'm connected to the board. And you could choose a file. I'm just going to go back to this one. I'm going to go into advanced, and what I have here is the ability to set up the, the settings actually on the board. So if I go in here, 
it'll read the settings from the board. You can see you can actually send these strings yourself and call these functions out over here. But it has a nice little window interface for you to do it. And I have all the settings set up in here just the way I have it for testing purposes. Um, this is actually the settings I had for the Rowdy. So we're going to have to change some of these things and uh, we'll go ahead and, and we'll post all these new settings that you'll be able to put in here. Once you put them in here, you, you basically just click on them. Once you put them in there, you can hit apply and uh, it'll set it up. Okay, so we're at the back of the machine. We're going to just double check everything. There should be, once you plug the USB in, which we did, there should be a little um, yellow light here. Not sure if that's going to show up on the camera, but uh, we're going to go ahead and plug the machine in and hope that we do not see any magic smoke. This is what you should see, blue light. Everything looks good. Um, remember we only have one stepper plugged in at the moment. The other one is free over here, just hanging. Make sure that the leads are not touching for the stepper motor. Just separate them, uh, tape them if you need to and just let that hang out to the side and your fan should be running because we have it plugged in to the power just close that up and that should give a, a nice airflow or however you have your box set up I'm not sure but that's the basic setup right now we'll go back to the front of the machine and we will try to jog the machine around alright so I've tried to set the camera up so you can see what's going on here a little better um, okay, so at this point, I have the USB plugged in, I have the power to the board plugged in, and everything looks good. Once again, under the Advanced tab, the Gerbil settings will be updated. Um, they're going to be different than this once we calculate what they should be, which I haven't done yet, but I will, and I'll post that. But one way you can get really close is... Um, let me go back over to this tab, which is access control. Uh, you can actually jog around and check to see, you know, how far they're actually moving in relation to your step size. And down here, you can see we have a step size drop down where you can pick 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 10, or 100 so millimeters. And I have it set for 10. So if I hit any of these buttons, we should get some kind of movement. So I'm going to just try. Uh, once again, just so you know, this is the front of the machine. And over here on the left-hand side will be our zero point. So zero on the Y, and all the way over here, zero on the X. And then wherever you set the Z, depending on what your work uh, piece is going to be, will be zeroed as well. Which you'll use the zero position for that. I'm just going to go and let's see if we can get our first step out of this and see if it's headed in the right direction as well. Okay, so that just moved back what it thinks is negative 10, which is, uh, which is actually wrong because our zero position is here. So anything that jogs from this point out into the field, into the work area, is going to be in the positive direction. So that should have because it moved back it should have jogged in the positive direction but according to this it actually jogged in the negative direction now I'm going to hit go home that did not work like it should have um, you can see that the Z went to the positive 5 so I'm just going to go back and if I hit zero position that zeroes out my work coordinates, but my machine coordinates still thinks that I'm at uh, negative 10, which I am, and the, and the 5. But I actually want to zero all that out. So I'm going to do a close on the port and then reopen it. And then you'll notice that everything is zeroed out, which is what we're after. So now I, I hit this, but it went into the negative position. So now I'm going to hit this one and bring it in. Hit it a couple of times here. Let me go to a hundred. I'm going to set this to a hundred and then hit it. It's 
cool we got some movement here switch this back to 10 be careful when you change this because you forget sometimes and um, and you can accidentally go too far okay I'm gonna call that zero and I'm gonna go ahead and try to jog the the uh, x-axis hit the right button okay that actually went in the right direction and it went into the positive value which is good can't really go by these arrows but the main thing you need to go by is knowing that this is your zero corner and everything out into there would be the positive. Just going to keep moving this over. And if you could see the back, I'm not sure if that's showing up, but it should be lighting lighting up green. Okay, so we'll call this the zero position on the Y. Now let's see where our Z is. Okay, Z is going down into the workpiece, which is our negative, which is okay. Bring it back down one more. Okay, I'll call that the zero position. And, of course, I can't actually come up here where I would normally be. There would be a spindle on here. I would be somewhere up in this corner to do my, to do my cut, but my laptop's in the way here. So, you know, any time that you do... A cut and you have your material on here your material could be a, a skinny piece of wood that you want to cut and that could be in the center here well you would jog it over to the left corner left bottom corner of that material and you would jog your bit down to touch the top of the material and you would say zero all and you'd zero the position and actually I would even my machine coordinates I would zero so I would do a close reset open and just make sure that everything is zeroed there now, no matter where I jog out into the into the um, the cutting area, I can always come back to this as my home position, and it should come back right to that exact position unless it misses steps or something along those lines. This particular software does not allow you to key jog, but I believe the Universal G Code Center will allow you to use your arrow keys to jog out, you know, into the into the cutting area and back I mean let's see here like I said this is all relatively new to me so I'm kind of learn it, learning it as I go as well and I'm sure after a while we'll all get the hang of it so these are the settings from the Rowdy so it's relatively close I think you know we're gonna find that these are a little bit different but one of the things I want to check out is under the Gerber settings if we can reverse motors on this one which I do not see no I don't see that. So one of the things that we know is wrong is that when we jog on the y-axis we are jogging into the negative and it should be the positive. So what we want to do is we want to reverse the y-axis motor. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. But before I do that I'm going to make sure that I unplug the power to the board and I'm also going to unplug it from the USB. So I'm going to close this out. I'm going to unplug the USB. And then I'll unplug the power to the board and we'll go back to the back of the machine. Alright, so here we are at the back of the machine. I'm unplugging the power now. You can see it takes a little while for it to power down. Make sure all that juice is out of there. Okay, so on our Y axis which is the one that goes into a wire block that is only working right now with this stepper eventually it'll work with both of them so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and reverse on this side here I'm going to go ahead and reverse the black and the green I'm going to put the green here and I'll put the black here on the bottom and that should reverse this stepper motor so let's go ahead and do that now Alright, so I've reversed these two. Green's on the inside now, black is on the bottom. And I'll put this back in. Close her up. And we'll go back around to the front and see how that works. Okay, now I've plugged the board back in and to the power. And now I'm going to plug in the USB here again. 
You can hear it kind of initialize there. We're going to open the port. And I'm going to jog this 10 steps. And you'll notice it went, I'm sorry, 10 millimeters, and it went roughly 10 millimeters into the positive direction now, which is perfect. So let's go home. Now, this program has a little bug, I've noticed. Once in a while, it'll actually go home, and then once in a while, it kicks the board out. I don't know why that happens, but the concept is that the Z-axis goes up, and then it moves along the X and Y until it gets to the home position, and uh, Z-axis is supposed to go back down, but it doesn't always work. So, But anyway, we can manually bring that back. And... On the step size for the Z, you can see that it went up. It went up into the positive 5 millimeters. So I don't want to jog that down 10. That might take it down too far. So I'm just going to set this on one step size, one millimeter. And then I'll jog it down one, two, three, till we get to zero. Okay, so now we're all zeroed out. That looks good. Just for the heck of it, I'll hit zero. And I'm going to put this back to 10. Okay, step size is on 10 now. Okay, so now that we have everything working in the right direction, we can jog. We can jog out, and as it goes out into the field, it goes from zero into the positive. We can jog out into the field. On the X, go to the positive. Now on the Z, it's actually um, up goes into the positive and down goes into the negative. And that works out just fine. Bring it back. Bring that back. And now we're zeroed out. Now the next move that we want to do is go ahead and hook up this motor to our Y axis and we'll, and we'll be set. We'll have all the motors running and at that point we'll get into uh, running our real first steps, our first G-code steps. So let's do that now. We're, gonna, we're getting into the wiring so of course we have to turn all the power off to the board. I just closed it, unplugging the USB and then I will unplug the power. We'll go back around to the back side. Okay, we're back around to the back side of the machine. Unplugging the power. We'll wait for that to power down. And once again with the wiring block, we're going to use this to go ahead and wire up the other stepper motor. Now we know that red and blue are our first coils. So those are definitely going to be tied together. And then what we'll do is we'll reverse the green and black, which in this case is actually uh, green and yellow. So the way, uh, the first test I'm going to do is uh, hooking this up to red, blue, and then I'll have yellow and green. So the first test will be red, blue, yellow, green. And that should be reversed. We'll test it. If it's not We'll swap the yellow and green, and we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and wire that up now. Okay, so we have this wired up, and of course, if you're going to do this properly, these should be uh, soldered together. I know some of you guys are cringing right now because I twisted them, but this is demonstration, so I just wanted to go through this and uh, get it posted so we could see it. But if you notice here, I have the red to the red, the blue to the blue, and I have green and black on this side. And then on this side, I have yellow and uh, green. Now, had I used the same wire color coming from this stepper motor, would have been a lot easier. We would have just swapped these two colors. But um, I didn't have that cable, so I ended up just using a different color. But the concept's the same. You get the idea. Um, you just swap two of any of either one of these coil wires. I could have, when I came in here, I could have swapped the red and and, uh, and blue. 
and we won't know if we have this one right yet. I should have recorded the wire colors coming in, uh, but they're under the uh, heat shrink, so I can't really see them now. Uh, but I'll be able to do a test, and it's actually a good thing to be able to try this uh, in case you're wiring up your own and uh, you want to make sure that you have it backwards or not. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do a single step, and we'll see which way they go. If they go in opposite directions, we obviously, on the stepper motors, we obviously have to swap uh, these two coils on the one coming in this way. And that'll take care of it. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to button this up real quick. Okay, so we have it buttoned back up, and you can see we have this stepper motor wire coming in through here. Now one thing I sh probably should have mentioned, now one thing I, I wish I would have done, and I will go back and redo, is I'm going to have this wire running back behind here, laying in the track all the way back behind here, and then come in the back here. Um, I just didn't think of it, and I accidentally put it in front of these wires. But for testing purposes, we might have to switch that out anyway. So we'll go ahead and um, leave it this way for now. I'm going to plug the power back in, and then we're going to head around to the front of the machine again. Okay, so we're back at the front of the machine. Now we're going to plug in our USB. You can hear the board initialize. And we're going to go ahead and open the COM. You should hear the click. And the first thing we're going to do is go to the step size and make sure you set it down to 1. And then we're going to jog the Y axis and just keep an eye on this stepper motor because I'm going to jog it away from me and both stepper motors should go away from me. And they do. So we are connected proper way. Put this back to 10 and let's jog out into the field. Nice. Let's set it to a hundred and really go out there. That's a beautiful thing right there. Bring it back. That's fantastic. Now, once again, if we had that hooked up backwards, we would uh, swap either one of those two coil wires um, coming in from this stepper motor, and that would have reversed it. Uh, but we we did good there. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can bring this back to zero. I set that back to ten. So I'm going to jog it towards me. Right now it's at eleven. So one more time. Then I'll set this down to one, jog it one more time, and then we are at zero. Set this back to ten. Okay, that's our step size. Alright, so we're actually ready to run our first G-code on the machine, and I have something I think we can use, so I'm going to go up here to choose file, and I've got just a little test on here of the open source logo, the open gear, and we're going to go ahead and make sure that the machine is in the zero position. If it isn't, you can do the reset, open it, and that will zero out the uh, machine coordinates. If you have to zero out the work coordinates, you can do zero there. And this will, if you look up here, it will tell you the width and the height, and you'll see that it is approximately well it is a uh, uh, about a hundred millimeters by a hundred millimeters a little bit more uh, so roughly four inches by four inches uh, square is this whole design and I made this in sketchy cam and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later to show you how to work with that okay so and if your Z or, or anything is off while the machine is, is, is sitting idle you can move these around so you can actually lift the Z up and down if you need to a little bit. I have it set up in the code, in this particular code, to move up, I believe, 5 millimeters. So that's called the safe Z travel height. And the idea behind that is as it's moving across the board, uh, the Z will move up 5 millimeters so that it doesn't hit the board or not anything that's in the way. 
Now, if you have if you had clamps or what or whatnot holding things down, of course you would probably set that safe Z to a higher. But that's sketch a cam as well when you're creating the actual G code. When you're actually creating this code, you'll be able to set all those settings up. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit begin. Make sure once again everything is zeroed. And we'll hit begin right here. And there it goes. Running its first code. And this software shows you in green lines where it's at. So it's it's already read ahead. I think it reads ahead 11 lines into the buffer. And then if you look, there's a red dot here. And it shows you where the bit or an approximation of where the bit should be. Now this is set up to do uh, step cuts which which basically means it will take like a 30 second or whatever I have it set up for uh, out each time and then it'll lower the bit a little bit more into the material and take another 30 second out lower it again another 30 second and it'll go through the whole thing like that now this software as far as I know doesn't allow it um, but there is one of the softwares we talked about earlier that will allow you to adjust the feed rate on the fly so if you're going too fast um, it, it, when you created the code if you're going too fast you can actually adjust the feed rate to uh, to lower that speed down um, but this is just and there, there's a million settings you can get into with CNC but I just want to go over the basics just so you can get the machine up and running and kind of get a feel of how it all works and then the fun is kind of learning uh, tweaks and just different things that you can do and as a community well, as we work together I think we can perfect one of these machines to, to just make a really good home based hobby CNC machine that doesn't cost a lot of money but can do a lot of cool things um, you know we can cut out our own plates and we can cut out plates for our friends and they can build another version of it um, like I said, this is Scarlight material on the on the end plates here, but it doesn't have to be. It could be aluminum. Uh, if you if you do the the cutting proper and you slow the feed rates down, um, you do your step downs with the Z very shallow. Use some oil. You could cut aluminum plates out. Um, I believe. I haven't tested it yet, but I believe you could. So you know this is the basics of it um, I, I do not have a router mount yet uh, that's something I have to get into and it's just awesome to see it come alive right now but one of the other things that I wanted to mention and uh, one of the one of the other things I wanted to mention is that on this design the the gantry plate is sorry on this design the x-axis itself is high it's up pretty high and you have a, a pretty good amount of movement on the Z um, which is not necessarily a good thing on a mill because it could cause flexing on your Z axis here which you don't want so one of the features that I wanted this machine to have is the capability of basically building a, a vacuum table uh, in here and I think it would be really cool to be able to do that but you have to have enough room in here to do it. We have plenty of room uh, inside this cavity to do that. So one of the ways that we're going to eliminate that whole thing where the Z doesn't move down as much and it gives you the strength from up in here, you know, in line with the wheel somewhere, is that we're going to build this box area up. We're going to use two three-quarter inch pieces of MDF where you see this green foam and that will bring this up high. And the cool thing about that is that you have a little bit of room to work here that means that we could add a vacuum table later if we want uh, which would bring it up even higher and the closer we get to the actual uh, gantry here the better off we are because there won't be uh, as much flexing um, most of the materials you're going to be cutting are probably going to be uh, you know quarter inch eighth inch um, you know up to maybe a three-quarter inch at the most I, I really don't see us going any thicker than that but if you do it's great that you can take this whole table assembly out for instance set it to the side put maybe a half inch which is what this foam is 
you could put a half inch piece of material in here and let me move this out of the way so I can see you know you could put a piece of of a half inch material in there and and then cut a, a thick you know block of foam for instance because you have basically from the bottom of here down is what you have to work with now if you had two three quarter inch pieces here um, you know you'd be up higher which is what you want when your material sitting on top here if you're only cutting a quarter inch thick material and it's aluminum or whatnot you want this up higher so that you don't have any flexing the routers mount it closer to where the, it's in line with these wheels and one of the cool things is if we use a vacuum system that's going to build this up even higher there's some talk about that on open builds about building a vacuum system I saw that and I was like oh that's fantastic so and one of the cool things about that is I want to be able to just put that whole thing you know have the have the whole table system off to the side bring it set it in here bolt it down and now I have vacuum hold down capabilities to this machine um, if not if I want to lower it I can take that whole thing out put a whole new one in there and uh, maybe use half inch material and then I can cut thick foam because you don't need a lot of strength to cut foam so overall um, I think this is going to be a really well universal machine just for the fact that we can introduce different build build surfaces and we can work off of that uh, we could put a t-slot table in here if we want to have hold downs um, there's all kinds of cool things you could take this whole thing out if you want it to and even put off to the side here possibly uh, a rotary axis and and do uh, rotary cuts with another axis which would be great you could even have that on one side and then have the other side where you have a table so if you cut out smaller parts you could do that over here along this whole length to the back and then have a rotary axis over here that you could you know mill out rotary projects so there's a lot of cool things that we could do with this machine and I know that through the open builds communities we will perfect it and it'll be awesome and um, so that pretty much covers you know controlling the machine getting it set up and you know as we go through on the form a lot of the guys that have already been down this road um, can help out as well as myself in, in just getting everybody up and running and, uh, and it should be a lot of fun now I'm going to uh, end this portion of the video and then we'll go through and uh, load up Sketchicam and then I'll show you, you know, how you export out of Sketchicam for a design and get into um, you know loading that design back up in here so congratulations for getting this far on the build you've got the machine up and running it's making its first steps it's awesome one thing I want to mention with a machine like this is it's great to have an emergency cutoff that just cuts the power to the board completely um, because the software stop takes a long time to actually stop so if the machine starts doing something crazy that it shouldn't be doing um, you know, have an emergency stop button. All you'd have to do is wire the the power cut off right out to here with a little, uh, you know, push switch, punch switch, and uh, and cut it off. So it's never a good thing to depend on the software stop. There's times when the look ahead, where it's looking ahead and buffering how many lines. I'll hit stop and it'll just keep running for another uh, ten lines or so before it actually stops. So at this point, this is a good time to test uh, the go home. So I'm going to hit the go home. And there it is. Like I said, that's a little buggy. Sometimes it doesn't work. This time it actually did. And there it is. We're back at the home position. So that concludes this portion of the build. And we'll move on to the Sketchicam portion where we can create a part and then we'll save it as a G code. And then you can load the G code right in here. Um, G code is just a simple text file of X, Y, Z coordinates. So we'll head over and do that now and then we'll come back and put it in here and see it in action. Okay here we are in SketchUp Make and you can download SketchUp Make from SketchUp.com under their products. It's a free download um, and SketchUp is an easy to use CAD program. It has a lot of cool features in that you can write scripts for it and upload them basically plugins that allow the program to grow 
One such plugin is called the um, Flatboys Sketchicam. And Sketchicam is a set of tools that allow you to create G code from a part that you create in SketchUp. So, just going to do a quick overview of how the tool system works. Bring that up here. I just want to show you that toolbar. I do not have a screen capture program, so this is the best I could do is just set up the um, the camera for it, and I hope this comes out okay. Uh, if you're looking to download SketchyCam, you can go to Open Builds or the Flatform, and you go up to Resources, and if you scroll down, you'll see that there's more than one page here. And you click on the next page, scroll down, you'll see SketchyCam here, and you can download with this link right here. And there's install instructions, easy install instructions right here. If you need more info, you can go to um, detailed instructions here. You can report bugs here and download SketchUp for free here. SketchyCam was created by volunteer programmers that thought it was a, a good idea. It's open source and they've been putting a lot of time and effort into it. So be sure to thank them over on the platform site. It's uh, really been a few years of a lot of hard work that went into it. Still a work in progress though. Okay, so you give a quick example. I've laid out um, our logo here for open builds and also an XYZ um, map just to kind of see where everything is. Our zero point is on the left hand corner. X to the negative, Y to the negative, heading back towards zero. And of course out into the field would be out this way. Now this is looking straight down on top of the machine. What I'm going to do is go up to here under the Flatboys parameters, open this up, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of uh, all the different settings that you can set up for the machine. And you can go through and tweak all these. Um, just going to go through real quick and, and set it up. This is for material thickness, uh, let's say six millimeters. you can also just hover over each one and it tells you a little bit about it okay so the safe travel here is three millimeters on the Z so as the bit comes up above the material so it would be above the six millimeters it will travel three millimeters above now if you had hold down clamps that were sticking up five millimeters you might want to make this uh, make this safe Z whoops where is it? safe safe Z travel of uh, you know eight millimeters for instance just to be sure or ten um, now here on the safe length and the safe width we have to set up the size of the machine where the safe it's safe area to actually cut and we're going to say 310 by 480 probably squeeze more out of it than that but that should work we're using an overhead gantry machine we are going to generate multi-pass and over here the multi-pass depth is 0.5 so half a millimeter for each step down you can set that to what you'd like um, it's not 3d um, code and then uh, show gplot after output which is a plotting program that will show you the output of the code once it's been created so if you have to you can go right back in and tweak it there's a lot more to uh, to this whole program you can go in and and read more about it on the platform as well. So you can put comments and remarks in here. We're going to hit OK. And when we do, you'll notice that it creates a dotted box here that is our safe cutting area with 0, 0 uh, for X and Y at the bottom left corner and then uh, 310 by 480. So this is our area that we can work in. I'm going to go ahead and let me just do some quick grabs here. I'm going to hit Control C for copy, Control Paste. This is all I really need out of there. Oops. And I always like to keep it backup copy, so I'm just going to copy this over here. 
I'm going to right click on it and go down to a context menu that comes with the Flat Voice tools. It's called Flat Edge and it has a few extra features and one of them is flatten selected edges. So I'm going to do that. What that does is it ensures that it is completely flat on the zero plane. Like you see here. Go back up to the top view. Okay, so now we are going to start using our tools. You'll notice if you hover over each tool, it has a hot tip. And it tells you a little bit about each one. We're not going to go into each one. I just want to do a quick demonstration. But uh, let's see. I'm going to do the inside cut tool. And you'll notice if you hover over top of, of an area, it will show that it could be, um, it'll show the offset of the bit. So you click, you wait. And you'll see that this white area is uh, where the where the cutout will be. And if you were to picture the bit, you know, being this big, it's actually going to cut on the black line. And then we'll do an outside cut, which is this first well, second icon. Do that. And we're going to do a couple tabs to hold the part in place. And really you should tab this, this one as well because it could come out. You could cut these tabs out easily, but actually I'm not going to do that for this. Just hit Control Z. If you run into a snag where you just want to erase one particular thing, you can click on the uh, eraser tool, and you'll notice in the bottom left-hand corner it gives you instructions for each tool, so you can filter through the different types of um, erasers by using the arrow keys. And the one that we need is a tab, and you'll see it comes up as a T, and then it'll only erase the tab. Okay, so just click over here on the arrow, and let me just triple click everything. I'm going to move it out away from this edge a bit. Somewhere in there. And then we'll click on this green icon here, this Generate Flat Voice G-Code. Click on that, G-Code, example. Then you're going to want to put dot G code. Hit save. Give it a minute and it tells you that it's been stored. Hit OK and then the G code plotter will show up. And if we angle that, we can see that the G code has been created and the G code's over here on the left. Ready to rock. And it's pretty cool because the G-code up here has some comments that tell you a little bit about the file before you cut it. So if you go through this and you wanted to cut this particular part but didn't have the actual file and had the G-code, you could say, okay, well, I see the feed rate, what it's set at, the material size, everything in here that you need to know um, to cut this part is listed. You'll notice that um, it has multiple red lines. These are the step downs. This is how many passes it's going to take to get through this material. Uh, depending on what it is, it may require even more step downs than that to get a good clean cut without putting too much stress on the machine. So that's, that's the basic layout. Now once you get to this point, the code has already been saved. This is just uh, bringing it back up. So now I could save this and we, I'll put it on a memory stick and we'll bring it over to the machine and see how it looks. I have the code on here now. I'm opening up Gerbil Controller. Um, I've already got the machine plugged in. The USB's plugged in. I'm going to open the port. Choose a file. And there's our code. You can see there. And we'll go ahead and make sure everything's zeroed, which it is. And normally, at this point, you would have your material in here uh, fastened down and then you would jog the bit down or move it by hand 
since the motors are always unlocked, you, you can actually move it by hand uh, simply by jogging this up and down. Get the bit exactly where you want it, just touching the top of the material. Start the spindle and then hit the begin. Alright, it's running great. And that pretty much concludes the ox build from start to finish. Um, of course, there's a lot to learn in between if this, if this is your first build. Um, you know, you have to get into the software, learn sketch -a cam This so control software is pretty straightforward. There's not much to learn here. Um, SketchUp is, is relatively easy to use. There's lots of video tutorials out there to just design parts. There's tons of plugins you can use to import uh, DXF files, STL files, all kinds of stuff. So um, SketchUp can be very powerful if you take the time to learn it. Everything that we've done here can be done um, you know, with other CAD programs. Um, you can create this G-code that we've created here. You don't have to use SketchUcam. You can use another uh, CAM solution and create G-code and run it on here. So it's just, um, it's just awesome. I mean, this is going to lead to all kinds of cool builds, I hope. And I hope you guys have enjoyed watching it. Uh, I'm excited to move forward on creating a spindle holder. Uh, also, like I said, another thing we need to do is build up the, the um, table. We want to use at least two three-quarter inch um, pieces of MDF there. And then your material goes on top. A lot of times, one of the first things that you do when you get a new mill and you put a spoiler board on top, they call the top one a spoiler board, so you'd have your baseboard, three quarter inch, fits in here. Um, you can probably get them at Lowe's to even cut that size out for you on their panel saw. You know, then you have your spoiler board that sits on top. That board, you want to do what they call a fly cut, which is you put a big bit on your, um, a wide bit on your on your spindle and you create a cut program where the bit goes back and forth and steps over a little bit each time it levels the, the uh, x-axis here out with the entire bed so that what all of your cuts will be even as you come across for your depths. Uh, once again it's going to be cool to see what kind of uh, beds we can come up with uh, for the future and just where this machine takes us I think it's going to be a great starting point and uh, hopefully it will just keep growing and turn into an awesome machine that becomes super useful. So thanks again for watching and that concludes the ox build. Hope you have fun guys.